here comes Miss Fanny Lou Hamer. Try that again. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Fannie Lou Hamer, and I live at 626 East Lafayette in Louisville, Mississippi. And I'm so happy to be here today. I want to thank Miss Kim and, and I want to thank Miss Rose for having me at this meeting. And I have my friend Bernie here who's going to be playing the piano for us. Now, I'm not looking for you to be just sitting here. Y'all are all invited into these songs that we're going to sing, these freedom songs, since you turned out to help with voter registration. Put your hand up in the air if you are willing to help with voter registration in this town up here in the north. We're going to see some more hands by the end of the day. <laughs> I was born October 6, 1917, and my parents were sharecroppers. They had a big family, 20 children. And I was the 20th child. And we all sharecropped. There was six of us girls and 14 boys. And we didn't need no machines to work the fields because they had all these children. And so we all share crop, pick between 50 and 60 bales a week. I know this because one day I was playing along the side of the road in front of the, the land. And the landlord, he, he come over and he say, Fanny Lou, now if you go out there and you pick 30 bales of cotton this week, I'm going to let you go in the commissary. Now, for you young'uns don't know what a commissary is. A commissary is a little store like you find nowadays on the corners. And we couldn't afford most of the things in there. And you would buy things on credit and 
and you hope you made enough during the year to pay the bill off. And he offered me Cracker Jacks and Daddy Wide Legs. And he offered me sardines, stuff he know we couldn't afford to buy. And so at six years old, I went out in that cotton field. And it's back breaking labor. And I picked me 30 pounds of cotton. But the next week, he said I had to pick 60 pounds. And by the time I was 16 years old, I was picking two to 300 pounds of cotton a week. But we never did get nothing out of no sharecropping. Seemed like by the end of the year, we would owe more than we had made. It was impossible sometimes to clear any money. And we, we lived in a house that didn't have heat, didn't have no water, no lights. It was bad conditions. And my papa, he, he kept on sharecropping, so we kept sharecropping. But one, one year he cleared some money and he bought two mules and he bought some plow and cultivating machinery. And he bought a piece of land, a little, well, he rented a little piece of land. And the house was in such bad condition about that time, he had just rented that land. We had to move to another house on the plantation while they did some repairs. And while we was gone, this white man, he come to our house and he go where the mules were and put Paris green poison in the trough. Mm. And he killed everything we had. And my papa never did get, get ahead ever again. My parents were old when I was born, so one by one, my sisters and brothers, they left. When they 18, some older, they were looking for a better life than what we had. And so when my parents were old, it was just me. I was the one that took care of them. And I remember one time saying to my mama, I wish I was white. Now don't you be judging me out here, because some of you know you wish that too one time or another. And, and I wish that because they were the only people who weren't doing nothing, but they had all the money and they had cars and they had food and clothes. My mama said to me, don't you ever say that again. Don't you ever say that again, Fanny Lou. She said, you be proud that you a little black girl. You be respecting yourself. And she said, when you grow up to be a woman, you respect yourself. And one day, they is going to respect you. My mother was a good woman. She was honest. She was dignified. And she worked very hard. Sometimes in the wintertime, when we had no food, when that money that we made sharecropping didn't stretch, she would go and she'd walk from plantation to plantation. And she asked them if they, she could collect the scrap. Now that was the little leftover pieces in the field after they had done, done the bales. And we would walk mile after mile after mile to collect that scrapping. And I remember we didn't have no shoes. And the ground was hard and cold, so she wrapped our feet in rags. And we'd go out there picking that cotton, that scrap. And she'd make a bale, and she'd sell it. And sometimes we had bread and milk most of the time. And sometimes we didn't have no bread. And sometimes we ate bread and onions. I 
I remember my mother. Sometimes we have to be in the field 4.30, you know, 5 o'clock. And after we pick cotton all day long, late over into the evening, you know, look like lonesome in that field. And then my mama would start singing. Oh Lord, you know just how I feel. Oh Lord, you know just how I feel. Oh Lord, you know just how I feel. Oh Lord. I heard you answer prayer, oh Lord, I heard you answer prayer, oh Lord, I heard you answer prayer, oh Lord, I heard you answer prayer, oh Now, oh Lord, we sure do need you now. Oh Lord, we sure do need you now. Oh Lord, I'm coming to you again. Oh Lord, I'm coming to you again. Oh Lord, coming to you again. Oh Lord, coming to you again. When I grow up, I had a life much like my mother's. I married a sharecropping man. <laughs> His name is Perry, Perry Hamer. I call him Pax. And I remember I was getting mad. In 1960, I was mad. We had been working that plantation for years. We got married in 1944 and had been working on the same land. So by 1960, I was mad. In 1961, I was still mad. 62, I was mad. <laughs> now I remember going out in that field in 1961. And I remember talking to the other ones out there. I said, this don't make no sense. They, they using us. See, we not making no money. We thumbing to get here. And they got cars. See, they ain't making no money off cotton. But they got cars. The, the wife got a car. The son got a car. The landlord got a car. They was just using us. Now, I could read and write. I didn't get much schooling, but I got me a job weighing and and taking the time. And not only did I have to wait and take the time, that landlord come give me his own pea. Now this pea was what we weighed the bales of cotton with. And it was weighted light. So he was cheating at every single weighing and I had to do this. So I brought my own pee to the field. <laughs> and I would use that pee. And when I see him coming, I switch pee. <laughs> I did something for my people, a little bit I could do. 
And then what really made me mad was when it rained and I couldn't be out in the field. I had to work in the house. Now, the thing that made me so mad in that house was that I had to cook for them all day long and clean and put the food on the table and be told, you got to wait till all us finish eating before you can eat. So I ate first. <laughs> I ate me good. And I would eat off them spoons. Now, I'm going to tell you, I know that some of the stuff I did was wrong. I'd eat off them spoons and then set that table. <laughs> and then I watch them eat what I done ate off of. And when they leave, I take me a bubble bath. I get down all in that tub. They only wanted me to clean. Because we didn't have no water, no tub in my house. So I get down in that tub and pour that bubble bath, use everything that they was using. Smell just like them. Now you know when you drinking, and somebody drinking whiskey, and you drinking whiskey, you can't smell each other. So I was smelling just like they were smelling, so they never paid attention that I was all in their stuff. <laughs> and then I had to take their clothes. I take them to the house. I had to wash them by hand. And they had even like help to do this. And I had to iron the clothes. So I wore the clothes. <laughs> When they wasn't around, and I knew they had gone a long way where I put them clothes on, walk out all proud, and go to a dance. Be looking sharp every day when they weren't home. And then I'd watch them wear them clothes that I had been all in. <laughs> I know some of the things I did wasn't right. I know. But it was the only way I could rebel. Pap and I wanted to have children. I had a couple of miscarriages. And I found I had this little tumor. It wasn't big. They could take it out, no problem. But when they had me in that operating room and I was asleep, they gave me a hysterectomy. I wanted to have kids. And I didn't know what they had done. I went back to that plantation. I was recuperating. But it seems the cousin of the doctor that did this to me was the cousin of the landlord's wife. And she said to the cook, <clears throat> now Fanny done lost more than just that tumor when they had her in that operating room. And the cook, she told somebody, who told somebody else, and it seemed like everybody knew about this but me. To one of my cousins told me what this man done to me. So I went to see him and asked him, why did you do this to me? But he didn't have to answer. And he didn't. Now people be asking me, well, why didn't you sue him? Sue him? A white man in Mississippi. What, I'm going to get a white lawyer to sue a white man for me? I might as well take the screws and screw them in my own coffin. So in 1960, I was mad. And in 1961, I was still mad from what he did to me. And in 1962, I was mad. And that was the year that my life changed. 
and I joined the civil rights fight. Woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. Come on. Woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. Help me out. Woke up this morning with my mind. my life, saved my life, because I went to a mass meeting near my home in Rulesville, Mississippi, <laughs> and everybody had gathered there to hear what they had to say. I had heard that it was about voter registration for black people, and now I ain't never heard of no Negroes registering to vote. So I was curious. So I went there and when they said, who wants to help go and register to vote at the state capitol? I raised my hand. I raised my hand as high as I could raise it. Now I guess I should have been scared if I had some sense. But what was there to be scared about? What could they do but kill me? And I felt like that's what they've been trying to do ever since I was born in Mississippi. And so I raised that hand and I signed up to register folks to vote. Well, 18 of us went to Indianola that day. 18 of us in this bus that used to drive sharecroppers and stuff around. We rented it. It was the SNCC workers, student nonviolent coalition for change. And we drove to the Capitol. And we went to the registration office. Now it took a long time because they only allowed two of us in there at a time. And I went in there and I filled out as much as I could fill out on that registration form. Now, I don't know if you young folks ever been in the office with your moms and dads, but some of you have tried, any of you tried to register? What would happen, what does happen, is that you have to fill out the paper and then take a test. Now in Mississippi it was 
to interpret the Constitution of Mississippi. Now, I didn't even know the state of Mississippi <coughs> had a Constitution. And if you didn't interpret it right to the satisfaction of the registrar, then you didn't get to register. So I filled out as much as I can, and I did as much as I can. And then I came out. Now, surrounding the whole building, up and down the street, were the largest number of policemen I have ever seen with weapons. You swear we were there to kill somebody. And as we began to come out, they were just looking at us and watching us and watching that bus. And we got on the bus. When everybody was finishing, we started to leave and the Enola to go home and we was pulled over, made to go back to Indianola. And they charged the bus driver with driving a bus that was the wrong color yellow. <laughs> the bus was too yellow, they said. Now this was a bus that was the color, the same color that took us out to the fields the same color that took people to chop cotton, the same color that took us to Florida in the winter time so we didn't starve to pick cotton there. But today it was the wrong color. So we gathered up our little bit of money and we didn't have enough for the fine. They wanted a hundred dollars. We had 35. And we were in the bus waiting to see what they were going to do with him. And I started singing. And everybody started singing on that bus. Come on now. bus driver back, they accepted the $35, the patrol man put it in his pocket. And we drove on back and I got a ride out to where I was living. And I was fired before I even got there. See, they had gotten word to the landlord that I had tried to register to vote. And so my children, me and Pap had gone on and adopted these two little girls whose parents could not feed them. And they come running, mama, mama. Mr. Marlowe come and he say that if you don't withdraw from registering, that you gonna have to leave. And so I went on in the house and I sat down on the side of my little girl's bed. Now, before I left that morning, I had packed a small bag because we were warned that this might happen. So I'm sitting there, and Pat, my husband, he come and Fannie Lou, Mr. Marlowe say, you got to withdraw or you're going to have to get leave. Go on and leave. And then there was Mr. Marlowe behind him. Pat, 
Did you tell Fannie Lou that she was going to have to leave if she don't withdraw that registration? And Pap said, yes, sir. And Pap left. I saw he was mad. And then he come walking over to me. Fair Lou, did you hear what I said? We ain't ready for this in Mississippi. And I thought, but I'm ready for it in Mississippi. <laughs> and he said, you gonna have to withdraw and leave this plantation. And even if you don't withdraw, you might have to leave. We ain't having none of this mess up in here. Ah, uh -uh, we ain't ready for you to register. And I said, Mister, because that's what we had to say. Mister, I didn't register for you. I registered for me. And he told me to get out. So I left. Went and stayed with my friends, the Tuckers. A couple nights later, bullets were fired into their house. Hit the headboard of where I was supposed to be sleeping. I was out the house at the time. And down the road, two girls were shot. And then they shot up into Mr. McDonald's house. Now I got a question for you. Is this America? Is this America murdering and shooting and lynching folks because they want to register and vote? I got kicked off that plantation that night. And I was set free. And now I can work for my people. Let me tell you a story about the worst thing that ever happened to me in 1962. I had begun working for that movement. It was August. We were sent for training up in South Carolina, Charleston it was. And we were coming back and we stopped at this little restaurant place. And four people went into the restaurant to get something to eat. And two people went to the bathroom. And I stayed on the bus. Here come the four out the restaurant, just a running towards the bus. And I got off the bus. I said, what's going on? And they said, well, there's a sheriff in here. And he told us to get out. So we left. And I said, that ain't right. That's not what's supposed to happen. It's illegal for them to do that. And Miss Ponder said she was going to take down the names and the, that she could see and the badges and the, and the license plates on the cars. Another police car pulled up and another one. And I sat back on the bus keys to see, you know, I knew that this was going to be the kind of thing that would happen in Mississippi. M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-B-B-I M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-B-B-I two folks come running out the bathroom and they was all grabbed up by the police and when I saw this out the window I got off the bus and then I hear somebody yell from one of the cars go get her too and they came over and they dragged me into the car these three men one a state police and a, another one a patrolman and a, another one in plain clothes and as I was getting in the car, they kicked me in the thigh in Mississippi. Come on now. M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. 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 All the way to jail in the car, they was questioning me, all three of them, and, and they wouldn't let me finish anything to answer. They keep cutting me off. 
And when we got in the jail to be booked, I saw this policeman go over to one of the young men that was with us and took all his weight and jumped on his feet. And then they started putting us in different jail cells. And I started hearing screaming and hollering. And I could hear, I could hear Miss Conda. I could hear her wherever they had her. And this policeman was yelling at her, can't you say yes, sir? And I would hear her say, yes, yes, I can say yes, sir. And then he would yell, then why don't you say it? And she would say, I don't know you well enough. And then I would hear her hit the floor. And I don't know how long this went on. But after a while, I've heard Ms. Ponda say, Lord, Lord, help me. Lord, please forgive these people. They don't know what they're doing. And after a while, Ms. Ponda come past myself. Blood was all in one of her eyes. Her mouth was all swollen. And her cell, and she was just leaning up against the brick wall. And then they came for me in Mississippi. M I S S I S S I P P I. M I S S I S S I P P I. M I S S I S S I P P I. M I S S I S S I P P I. them in there. The state patrol man, a policeman, and the man in the plain clothes. And the state policeman, he asked me, where are you from, gal? And I said, Louisville, Mississippi. And he said, I'm going to check that out. And he left. And after a while, he came back. And he said, yeah, you from Louisville. See, because ever since I tried to register, there was a bullseye on my head. And he said, you going to wish you were dead. And they took me to another cell. And in that cell were those three white men again and two black prisoners. And I saw the state patrolman give one of the black prisoners of a blackjack. It was weighted and heavy with something. And they ordered me to lay face down on a, on a cot. And I laid down. Five men's in this room with me. And they ordered the first prisoner to beat me. He had to beat me because they said, you know what we going to do if you don't beat her. So he beat me until he was exhausted. I was exhausted. It was horrible. And then they took that black check and they gave it to the second prisoner. Now, I had been holding my hands down over my left leg, see, because I had polio when I was little, and I knew this second beat and I couldn't survive it. So I was trying to protect my leg. And the second prisoner, he said, move that hand, I don't want to beat your hands. But I had to protect that leg. And when he started beating me, I started screaming. I couldn't help but screaming. And that state highway patrolman, he told me to shut up, stop screaming. And he came over and beat me in my head, stop screaming. And so I, I took one hand and I pushed my head down in the mattress to muffle the, my cries. And then they ordered the first prisoner to sit down on my feet so I couldn't work. 
Markham. It was horrible. And my dress started working up. And I reached and I tried to pull it down and this, this policeman, he come over and he pulled my dress up as high as he could. Five men in this room and just me. I don't know how long because I passed out. And when I come to that state highway patrol, he said, get up, fat so And I tried to get up. But I couldn't get up. And I kept trying. And you know God makes a way in Mississippi, M I S S I S S I P P I, M I S S I S S I P P I, M I S S I S S I P P I, M I S S I S S I P P I. When I got to myself, I couldn't move. They had beat my hands and my hands were bruised and my arms were bruised. And my legs, my whole body was swole up. And I remember I couldn't lay down. And then one of the white jailer's wives came and she come with some food one day. And I asked her, are you a Christian? I guess that question must have got to her because she never came back. At the trial, I was charged with disorderly conduct and resisting arrest. And sitting over there in the jury box was that same policeman that was there for the beating. And it was then that I learned that Megger Edgar Evers had been shot in his front yard in Mississippi. M I S S I S S I P P I. M I S S I S S I P P I. M I S S I S S I P P I. M I S S I S S I P P I M I S S I S S I P P I M I S S I S S I P P I M I S S I S S I P P I Ain't gonna let segregation turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let segregation turn me around. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a walking, marching on the freedom land. Race hate ain't gonna let no race hate turn me around. Hey! 
turn me around. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching on the freedom land. <laughs> now in 1964, now we called it Freedom Summer or Mississippi Summer. We had all these young people, black and white, come on down to Mississippi and other states to help with registration to vote. Now I was asked to go on up to Oxford, Ohio, and to help train these SNCC workers to register people to vote. It was a nonviolent movement, so we had to teach them how to do them sit-ins and to not fight back while people put hot cigarettes down their backs and pour food over them and beat them. Them young people, I, I loved them. They rode them freedom rides and the buses were turned over and we lost some. But God brought Moses to Egypt land. And he said, let my people go. Pharaoh, let my people go. And the Lord brought us Bob Moses to Mississippi. Now you can see how God was working. He brought Moses to his people. And Bob Moses said, let my people go. Can I get an amen? amen. And so I, sent where, I went where Moses sent me. And I took my voice. And I took my songs. And I can remember when they'd first come, they just would be kind of milling around. And then I'd start singing. And you could begin to see them organized. <laughs> now, it wasn't easy, I mean, bringing white folks down to Mississippi. There was folks in the SNCC movement that felt this should just be a white outside and just black folks running it. There wasn't no place for no white folks, they felt. This was a Negro movement, and we had to do this for ourselves. Folks like Stokely Carmichael and others did not want this white invasion. But I said, we can't ask for integration if we don't integrate ourselves. And so the students came. Now, like I said, it wasn't easy. You had all these Young white folks, over 900, 120 some of them from them big schools like, like Yale and Princeton and Harvard. And there were complaints that there weren't enough Negro young people coming from the North. But these children, they had time. They had the money to come and work for a summer for free. And so I understood, but some of them didn't understand. And then we had a problem with some of them young white girls. You see them sitting close to the black boys and playing cards and waving at cars going by. Some of them cars had KKK that was patrolling up and down to see where homes were that was hosting these kids. Come to burn it down and they just sitting there waving. I wanted to call some of their mothers and say, take your child back home and send your son. Things were not easy and there was tension between the black SNCC worker girls and the, and the Negro boys. Because see, the black girls were not interested in these white boys. They had been fighting off white men all them lives. But them, them Negro boys, well, they was curious. 
And they make the white girls mad because they be messing with them at night and then pretending they didn't know them in the daytime. But they was trying to survive. And there's just one volunteer, well, a couple volunteers, they done wrote books about what they've been through. One of them called Sally Belford. And Sally Belford wrote about her experience. You gonna help me, Bernie, with this. Come on now. Let me tell you what she said. Come on now. I'm getting a little old, you know. Come on. She said this. Well, this could well describe many snick Negroes whose deep hate and love broke down to black and white. They were so suspicious of us, us white volunteers. Throughout this freedom summer, they put us all to the test. But we didn't have to come. Oh no, we didn't have to come. We could have stayed at home, gone to the beach, earned the money that we needed for school. We didn't have to come. Oh no, we didn't have to come. We could have stayed at home and never gotten from Tuskegee, Alabama. One of them, Sammy Young Jr. 
He stayed with me a while and I, I helped train him. He became a wonderful organizer in the movement. Now he had been in the war and he was, he was a hard worker. He was dedicated. He had been arrested several times. I love that young man. 1966, he was murdered by a cop, put a bullet in his head at a standard oil gas station for using the white restroom. In that first wave of folks that we sent down to Mississippi, there was James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Mickey Schwimmer. They was down there in Philadelphia, Mississippi, a hotbed of racism, registering black folks to vote, organizing freedom schools. They had spoke at a church, and the church had been burned down. Over 30 churches in that county alone were burned in the state of Mississippi. And they, they went to investigate. And they were arrested coming from the church. And they were never seen again. Took them over a month to find their bodies buried in a dam. The police and FBI, the army base that was nearby, they, they went and they dragged rivers and ponds looking for their bodies. We knew they were dead. They found, they found eight bodies of black men. One, a 14-year-old boy wearing a core t-shirt. They identified all but five of them. And so we lost Cheney. Schwerner, Goodman, and that first wave of sneaker workers. And the kids were the scared. I, I, I know they were scared. Some of them were talking about leaving Mississippi, and, and we were training some more, and they weren't sure. And we told them they could all go home. Not one of them left. Not one of them. And we lost more. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me to help me stand. I am tired, I am weak. I am lost through the storm, through the night. Lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. While the kids were organizing the voter registration, I was helping to organize. Now, we have been trying to register folks to vote in Mississippi. And it was becoming impossible with all the bombings and killings and lynchings. People were losing their jobs and their homes and their possessions. And we knew we had to take it out of the state to the federal government. We had to take this fight to the country. And so Bob Moses and Ella Baker and others, we founded the Freedom Democratic Party. Mississippi Party. I'm sorry, the Mississippi 
Freedom Democratic Party. I should know this. I don't make it. <laughs> and it was our plan to go to the 1964 Democratic Convention in New Jersey. And we was going to challenge the seating of them regular Democratic Party delegates that were elected only by white folks. We held our own election when they wouldn't let us vote in the primary. We called it the freedom ballot. And black and poor white folks voted. They didn't have to go to no courthouse and be scared because their name was down in some book. And they didn't have to take one of them literacy tests. I don't know if you know, in some states, they would have a jar of candy on the counter. Tell you, if you could tell them how many pieces was in that jar, you could vote. So we didn't have none of that going on. We registered over 80,000 people in the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And we held our own convention. 2,500 delegates showed up from all over Mississippi. And I was chosen of one of those delegates to be sent to the Democratic National Convention. <laughs> now we had talked to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he talked to President Johnson about the, going to the Credentials Committee of the Democratic Party and having us seated instead of them other Democrats from Mississippi. They weren't no real Democrats anyway. They were talking about voting for Barry Goldwater, who was more in line with their racism. And so when we got to the convention and went to talk to the press, I was chosen to speak. And I told my story of what happened to me as a sharecropper. And I told my story about that beating him with Nona. Tears were running down my face. And the media was gathered around and they put me on that television. And do you know what President Johnson did? Do you know what he did? He called a press conference, an emergency press conference. Now see, he didn't want us messing around in the Democratic Party because he was afraid them Southern delegates wouldn't vote him in for the nomination. You know he got in there because President Kennedy was killed, right? So I'm talking to the press and they cut me off. Except they kept taping. And they aired President Johnson. And you know what he got on that television to say? They thought he was gonna announce his vice presidential cho choice, you know. He talked about that Governor Conley down in Texas, the ninth month, the ninth month, like he was birthing something, of his being shot when Kennedy was killed. But they taped me and played me over and over again on the television so Johnson didn't get his due. And see, Martin Luther King had come to negotiate for us to be seated. And Johnson said, Herbert Hoover, Humphrey, them black folks get me confused. <laughs> <laughs> and Walter Mandel and J. Edgar Hoover to negotiate with the Credentials Committee. And Dr. Martin Luther King, I'm so mad at him, I don't know what to do. Them preachers. I tell you, we could be a lot further ahead if it wasn't for two things in Mississippi. Preachers and teachers. <laughs> Cowards, every last one of them. And he came up with a deal behind our backs, well, along with a few of the other 67 delegates that was with me to accept two seats 
at large with no vote. And I remember saying to Herbert Hoover, I said, I don't understand. So you want to keep your little vice president job. And your job is more important than 400,000 Negro lives in Mississippi. And so we refused to take those seats. We refused to take them. I told them we didn't come down here for no two seats. All of us are tired. And we left. Now, I think it was three of us did go on and stay down there. And they borrowed passes from other delegations. And they would sit in the empty seats. But then the next day, the chairs weren't even there. And we never got seated at that convention. But, but something changed. Johnson agreed in the, to have the Democratic Party not accept delegations that were elected through discriminatory voting practices. And finally, some of us members were seated in the 1968 Democratic Convention. There was no more Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, but we had helped bring about that change. Now, a lot of people don't talk about it, but I was at the Selma March, that last Selma March, me and Stokely Carmichael and others that folks don't talk about a whole lot, but I don't do what I do for the credit. I do what I do because it's the right thing to help my people. And uh, I want to tell you a story. <laughs> I want to tell you a story about this little girl named Cheyenne Webb. Because people forget this movement was also a children's movement. Not only college students, but little children. And Cheyenne Webb was one of them children. See, she was going to school one day. Well, let me let her tell I was going to school one day. <laughs> and me and my friend, we were late. And we saw in front of the church down the street, we saw these black cars pull up. And so we wanted to see what was going on. And well, we saw these people get out of the car, these men dressed in suits. And swear to God, I thought I saw Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King! <laughs> and so, me and my friend, we snuck in the door of the church and hid behind the last pew. <laughs> but they saw us. <laughs> and it was Dr. Martin Luther King that said, what y'all doing back there? <laughs> And he called us up front. Ain't you supposed to be in school, he said. Yes, sir. <laughs> and he said, now we gonna have a mass meeting in this church on Sunday. I wanna see you there, okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> and we ran all the way to school. Well, we were late, so we were in trouble. But we told him, we saw Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> and they thought we was lying, but we told him what happened. And the teachers were gathered around asking what was going on. What was... And they said, we, we told them, we go into the mass meeting on Sunday. Well, by the time I got home, you know how it was. <laughs> Your parents knew everything by the time you got home. Sometimes they had that belt ready. <laughs> and my parents told me I could not participate in no mass meeting. They didn't want me getting killed or hurt. Children had been hurt and killed. And they didn't participate because they didn't want to keep their jobs. 
A lot of them teachers who would gather around wouldn't participate because they wanted to keep their jobs too. But I didn't have no job. <laughs> so on Sunday, I opened my window and I snuck out and I went to that mass meeting <laughs> and I was in the back with my friend and Dr. Martin Luther King said, Cheyenne Webb, <laughs> point at me. Cheyenne Webb, come on up here. <laughs> and I stood right next to him while he spoke to them people. There's a picture of me right next to him. <laughs> well, they talked about a march that they was going to do, and I knew I was going to be in it. But when I got home, I got in a lot of trouble, and I was told not to leave the house again for none of this no civil rights nonsense. I was going to cause trouble for the whole family. <laughs> But I snuck out again, and I marched. They couldn't keep me from marching. Again and again, I got in trouble, but I went. And finally, they stopped asking me not to go. And I was there for that first Selma march. See, they had killed a civil rights worker. And we were going to march to protest it. And I remember we gathered before we went over the bridge and we, we got down on our knees and we prayed. And then we started up over that bridge and we got to the top. All I could see was a wall of white men. They had, had billy clubs and guns and, and they were on horses and they had dogs and they were coming straight at us. And I started to get down on my knees and, and pray like we had started, but, but somebody was running past me and they were screaming and tearing ass all around. And, and I turned around, I started running too, but this man named Jose Williams, he, he grabbed me up and started running with me and I said, put me down, put me down. See, he wasn't running fast enough. <laughs> and I ran and I ran all the way home. I ran like my life depended on it. And then Martin Luther King came and they marched to the edge of the bridge and they prayed and I was there again. And I was there on the third march when we made it all the way over that bridge. It took us days, but we marched to the Capitol. And I remember Martin Luther King standing on the steps saying, how long will it take us to realize the promise of justice in society? It felt so good after the last march It was like we had overcome We had reached the point that we were fighting for For a long, long time And if you were to stand in the midst of the thousands and thousands of people and all the great leaders and political people who had come from all over the world. I asked my mommy and daddy for my birthday present to become registered voters. They took me to the polls with them to vote. And I'll never forget it. And the thing that made it so unique to me was the fact that it was something so simple, just a mark on a ballot. I thought it would be such a long drawn out thing because of how people had to fight. But it was only the matter of walking into a building and making a mark. It was exciting. It was 
was exciting for me, it was exciting for me to see. And I'll never forget it, my parents voting, my parents voted and made history. After all of the marching and all of the tear gas and all of the beatings and all of the dying, it was simple. It was simple. It was so simple. After all of the marching and all of the beatings and all of the tear gas and all of the dying, it was simple. It was so simple. all excited after that march. We stood there and we heard Martin Luther King say, how long will it take us? How long? And then that night, Viola Lee would saw a white woman had come down from Detroit to help in this march. She was killed. See, she had seen on the news the terror of that first march. All of these people beaten and bloodied. And she knew she had to do something. See, she had organized in her own community, even homeschooled her own children when she was fighting against the school board. Spent some time in jail for refusing to send them there to substandard schooling. And so when she saw what was on that television, she got in her green Oldsmobile, told her husband where she was gonna go, left her children, five of them, with friends and family, and she drove on down to Selma, Alabama. Now she used that green Oldsmobile to drive people back and forth between Montgomery and the Capitol. And she helped organize, and on the other end, she drove people back to Selma, those who were sick and weak from the march. Days of marching. And when she returned to the capital on one of them trips, a young black civil rights worker named Mr. Morton. Yeah, it was, it was Morton. He needed a ride back. And so they jumped in her green Oldsmobile and they stopped at a gas station where they were harassed and shouted at by another car full of men. And when they left the gas station, they were followed. Mm. They were driving 90 miles an hour and that car pulled up next to them with them white men in it and they shot her through the glass, glass shattering, and the car flipped over into a ditch. Morton, he was covered in her blood, and one of the KKK men, he come over to look to see if they all was dead, and he just laid there still, and they thought he was dead. An FBI informant was in the car and he called J. Edgar Hoover and told him what happened. And Hoover, who didn't like Dr. Martin Luther King, he told his FBI agents to tell lies on, on that girl. They said Viola Luyuto was down there to have sex with black men down in Mississippi. Said that them marks on her arms from the shattered glass from that bullet was where she was doing drugs. Shooting up. Said that she was a bad mother because she left her children. They said she was a bad mother. She left her kids. Selfish woman. Troublemaker. Loose morals. Nigga. 
of love and a front to southern white womenhood. They killed Viola Liuzzo and maligned her name. Even her church friends turned on her. But the truth is that she tried to set all of us free. Tonight we honor her memory. She was a good mother. She loved her kids, brave woman. She marched for peace. She loved humans, be they black or white. Tonight we honor her memory. How long will it take us to realize the promise of justice in society? How long will it take us to realize the promise of justice in society? One more song. I'm gonna be finished soon. <laughs> they say I like to talk a long time. But I don't. Know. I don't know. She even thinks that up in heaven her class lies late and snores. While poor black sheriffs, they rise at seven to do celestial chores. I got shoes, and you got shoes. All God's children got these Black cherubs, they rise at seven to do celestial chores. I got wings and you got wings. All God's children got these wings. When I get to heaven, gonna put on my wings. I'm gonna fly, I'm gonna fly. She even thinks, she even thinks, she even thinks. I'm sick and tired of being called auntie. I mean, I don't know if I'm ever going to be allowed to be a woman. For 39 years since I was a child, I was called girl. And now I'm 46 and they call me auntie. Now I'm here tonight to make an announcement. I don't have no white nephews or nieces. <laughs> so if you can't call me Mrs. Hamer, just call me plain old Fanny Lou. I'm not your aunt. <laughs> now I ain't here to make people feel all comfortable. Hmm. I'm here to tell it like it is. So I'm gonna say this. Now, sometimes I feel more sorry for white women than I feel for us. Because mm -hmm. you know, they worked my grandmother. They worked my mother. And then they got a hold of me. Black women been used year after year after year. 
Now, there was nothing to make you think that you were the same as me. To think that underneath your white pigment that you had red blood just like me. And that was happening because you had more. You were put up on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. And then you were put inside this like ivory castle. But I'm going to tell you, we done busted that castle down. And we done whooped the hell out of that pestle stuff. And when you hit the ground, you're going to have to fight like hell, just like us. Because you see, white women's freedom is shackled like a chain to my freedom. And white women are starting to realize they can't be free unless I am free. Hmm. Women of all colors need to come together and, 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 and form their own majority voting block. Because white mothers are no different than black mothers. Now y'all might have a few less problems. But we all cry the same tears. And, and we have moved forward some, but we can see, we, we can see that we can design a new day. A day where little black children, little black boys and, and little black girls can walk on down the street without fearing that hatred is going to make some policemen attack them. We can build a new day. Now, I don't have anything to be afraid of. I don't know if today, I don't know if tomorrow, I don't know if I'm going to make it home to Louisville tonight. But see, if they kill Fannie Lou, if they kill me, it's just the one that's standing in front of you. And what they don't know is that freedom is like, it's like an eating cancer. You kill me, and it's gonna break out all over the place. Now there's something I don't wanna hear, and, and, and I'm gonna finish soon, but I, but, I don't want to hear before I'm finished. I don't want to hear, well, well, honey, well, honey, um, uh, I don't want to be all up in this mess. If you were born with a black face, you were already in the mess. And I don't want to hear before I finish, and I'm finishing soon, I don't want to hear that, ooh, honey, I'm going to follow behind you. Well, move from back there. I don't want you behind me. You could be 200 miles back. I want to hear you say that I will be beside you. I will be with you. And then we can go up that freedom trail together. Thank you. for the show, but all of the words were hers. The songs were songs that she sang, except for the storytelling songs. The music was written by Bernie, and the words were put together by me. Thank you so much.